up until now, our focus has been exclusively on differential equations for time-dependent problems. The most important of which has been the Cauchy problem. What all those time-dependent problems have in common is that we have got some initial condition of one or many variables, and then we follow the evolution of these one or many variables over time. Over time as they behave in accordance to some differential equation. However, such initial value problems are only one part of the story. There's a huge body of literature on a completely different type of problems associated with differential equations, namely so-called boundary value problems. These boundary value problems do not describe the evolution of some quantities over time, but rather they describe stationary situations that are described by some differential equation and that conform to some boundary conditions. Such boundary value problems are quite important in physics, in engineering, in biology, and their mathematics is quite different from time-dependent initial value problems. That is true for theoretical mathematics, and as we shall see, the numerical methods that we utilize for boundary value problems have got a very different flavor as well. The purpose of this video is to give you an introduction to boundary value problems with a few examples from applications. Structural engineering is an area where boundary value problems appear all the time. Typically in structural engineering, you've got forces acting on constructions and providing that everything is stable, you get some equilibrium configuration of the construction. For example, if you set up a skyscraper, then gravity will slightly deform the construction and solving the corresponding boundary value problem will give you an idea of what are the forces affecting the construction material. For one simple example, let's suppose we have got a wooden, a wooden bridge. That wooden bridge spans over a vast chasm. As we walk over the bridge, Due to our mass, we have gravitational effects, and so we push the bridge down. So let's suppose the bridge has length L, and we stand right in the middle of the bridge. And then let's say that you know, we set up a, co a coordinate system. The left end of the, of the bridge has position x equal minus L over 2, and the right end of the bridge has position x equal L over 2. As we stand right in the middle of the bridge, our weight applies a force f that is proportional to our body mass and that is pushing the bridge downwards and as we're standing in the middle of the bridge we are contemplating okay what is the vertical displacement of the bridge due to our force so we let the function y of x be the vertical position of the bridge elements at position x where x ranges from minus l over 2 up to l over 2 so for example y of x will be 0 at the left and at the right end point of the bridge because there the position is fixed. But for example, in the middle, y of x will be negative because we're pushing the bridge downwards. And as we think about the vertical displacement y of x, we actually find that it can be described by the differential equation. Namely from, but, namely, from theoretical engineering, we know that y of x can be described with a reasonable degree of approximation by the following differential equation, namely y prime prime of x equals sigma times f over 2 times the absolute value of x minus l over 2. In that context, sigma is some positive material parameter. The differential equation does not give us y itself, but it tells us that the second derivative of y obeys some formula. Intuitively, y prime prime, the second derivative of y, describes the bending of the bridge. So we see, okay, the second derivative of y is proportional to f, the force that is applied. I think that's intuitive. And at any position x, we have got this term absolute value of x minus l over 2. And if you think about it, actually, this term, the last fact, that last factor, 
absolute value of x minus l over two just tells us how far we are away from the endpoints of the bridge. So the bending of the bridge will be st very strong in the middle, but it will be less towards the endpoints of the bridge. Okay, so that's the differential equation. The differential equation itself does not tell us the precise solution, so we need some additional information. Namely, we have got two boundary conditions. The boundary conditions tell us that the vertical displacement of the bridge at the bridge endpoints is zero. At the left endpoint, y minus l over 2 equals zero, and at the right endpoint, y of l over 2 equals zero. That simply tells us that this bridge is fixed at the left and the right endpoints. So in summary, the vertical displacement of the bridge can be described by the following boundary value problem. We have got the differential equation y prime prime of x equals sigma times f over 2 times the absolute value of x minus l over 2. And we've got the two boundary values y of minus l over 2 equals 0 and y of l over 2 equals 0. From the perspective of engineering, needless to say that this differential equation is only true for fairly small values of f. If we put more and more weight in the middle of the bridge, then this equation will no longer be true. And eventually also the boundary values will no longer be satisfied. Let us contemplate a bit how this compares with initial value problems. So we got this second order differential equation. And in order to fix the solution uniquely, we have two more conditions. Then we prescribe the value of y at two different points. If that differential equation were to be used for an initial value problem, then we describe the value of y, for example, at the left end of the bridge, and also the first derivative of y at the left end of the bridge. But in the case of an initial value problem that describes some sort of dynamic evolution. Instead here, this boundary value problem consisting of the differential equation and the boundary values describes a stationary configuration. So philosophically, boundary value problems are quite different from initial value problems. And from a mathematical perspective, they are very different as well. Let's do another famous differential equation that has emerged in structural engineering. Namely, we take a look at the static beam equation. So let's suppose we've got a clamped beam of length L. That beam might consist of, for example, steel or some other material. Mathematically, these materials only differ by some material parameters. And then we clamp this beam to the left and the right and we apply some force in the middle. So we're interested in the vertical displacement of that beam. So for any position, for any horizontal position X, we would like to know how far has the beam moved down. So as we keep pushing the beam down in the middle, we would like to know what is the vertical displacement of uh, the beam at any position X between these two clampings here. The image here is not to scale, but for a very sm for comparatively small forces of F by which we push down the beam, we can actually use the differential equation that describes us the, di the vertical displacement. So now the fixed notation, we introduce a coordinate system. Now maybe say in the middle of the beam, we have got position X equals zero, and the left endpoint until we hit the wall is x equal minus l over 2. And the right endpoint is x equal l over 2. And that's the horizontal coordinate system. And the vertical coordinate system has it that at the wall, the beam has position 0, y equals 0. And of course, uh, upwards is positive y direction. And downwards is a negative y direction. 
We would like to describe the vertical displacement of the beam at every position x. So this time the force is supposed to be applied all over the beam. For example, it might be gravity. Maybe we have different weights distributed all over the beam. And mathematically, we describe the force that is applied on the beam by a function f. That function goes from the interval minus L over 2 up to L over 2 into the real numbers. And for any x from this interval, f tells us what is the force applied at this point x. And then we introduce a function for the vertical displacement, namely u is defined over this interval from minus L over 2 up to L over 2. And at any position x, u of x is a real number that tells us the vertical displacement. In that context, if u is negative, it means the beam at, the, at that position x has been displaced downwards. Okay, and then we also have boundary conditions. Namely, due to the structural configuration, on the one hand, we can assume that there's no vertical displacement of the beam at the boundaries. So u of, of minus L over 2 equals 0, and u of L over 2 equals 0 too. Also, we assume that the beam does not suffer any kinks. So to the left and the right, the derivative u prime equals 0. So u prime of minus L over 2 equals 0, and u prime of L over 2 equals 0. These boundary conditions mean that the beam does not move at the boundaries, at the vaults, and also it's flat towards the vaults. Okay, and then from structure engineering, it is known that the vertical displacement satisfies a fourth order differential equation. So specifically, elasticity theory provides us with the differential equation sigma times u prime 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 of x equals f of x. That's the fourth order differential equation. And that is satisfied by the beam, by the vertical displacement function u. In that context, again, sigma is a positive constant. That altogether provides us with the ingredients for a boundary value problem. Namely, on the one hand, we have got the differential equation, sigma times fourth derivative of u of x equal f of x, which is valid for all x between minus l over 2 and l over 2. And then we've got the boundary conditions for this fourth order differential equation. Namely, the function u itself is fixed at the boundary and also so is the first derivative of u. So that's a very simple example of what differential equations might appear in fraction engineering or in elasticity theory. The boundary conditions are already indicated here in this picture. Namely, the vertical displacement along the walls is zero. The beam stays fixed there. There's no vertical movement. And as indicated here, also the derivative of the vertical displacement is zero towards the boundary. Within the walls, we assume that the beam is horizontally flat, and this also extends a bit, and this also extends to some degree to the area between the walls. A famous example of a differential equation shows up in thermodynamics, and that differential equation describes a stationary distribution of heat. So to begin with, let us suppose I've got a pipe of length L that is filled with some liquid. And okay, I position, I position that pipe, and then I start heating the pipe somewhere in the middle. And let's suppose we do this in some technical facility, and we have some cooling devices that we attach to the left and the right end point of the pipe, which keeps the temperature of the liquid constant there. So we keep the heat source constant. What we will observe over some time is that the heat distribution within the pipe will be stationary, but it will also be non-uniform. So at different, position of, at different positions in the pipe, you've got different temperature, and eventually, 
after an hour or two, the temperature distribution will be stationary and will not change anymore. I mean, the cooling devices might be doing quite some work, might have to do quite some work to keep the temperature conditions static. But eventually, if everything looks out, you've got a stationary heat distribution. We would like to describe this mathematically. So let's introduce a coordinate system. Let's say the left endpoint of the pipe has position x equal minus L over 2, and the right endpoint has position x equal L over 2. And for any x between the left and the right endpoint, we associate how much heat is produced into the pipe. So that reason we introduce a function f, which is defined over this interval from minus L over 2 up to L over 2, and maps into the real numbers. And that function f tells us how much heat is generated at every position x. For example, if I put a fire under the, under the pipe, for example, if there's a fire under the pipe, then in the middle, the function f might have some positive value and probably towards the endpoints of the pipe, the function f might be zero. So that function f describes the generation of heat at every position x. Once a stationary heat distribution has been established, we would like to describe that heat distribution mathematically. And so we introduce a function t, which is defined over the interval between the left and the right endpoint and maps into the real numbers. And t of x is obviously temperature at position x. Then as time goes by, the heat distribution will become stationary. And the stationary heat distribution t will satisfy a boundary value problem. At the left endpoint of the interval, L over 2, we have a constant temperature. At the right endpoint of the interval, at minus L over 2, we have a constant temperature. And the so function t satisfies the differential equation t prime prime of x equal f of x. In other words, the second derivative of t equals the heat generation f. Technically, we can also deduce some proportionality constant, but let's keep the model simple at this point. Okay, so that is a differential equation. Fortunately, the differential equation is fairly simple and we can explicitly solve it. The solution to that differential equation works roughly as follows. The solution to that boundary value problem works as follows. So let's suppose I've got a function f, which is a defined on the interval from minus L over 2 up to L over 2. And I am posed that this function satisfies the differential equation without any boundary values. So S prime prime of x equal f of x. Fortunately, for that simple differential equation, it is fairly easy to find a function S, which satisfies that. The only thing we need to do is to take integrals. So we take the antiderivative of the antiderivative of f, and that provides us in the, the function s. Fortunately, it's fairly easy to define such a function s. Now maybe take the antiderivative of the antiderivative of f. So let us suppose then that we have got this function s. So equipped with that function s, we then define the general solution to the differential equation. That solution is, that general solution is t of x equal s of x plus c1 times x plus c2, where c1 and c2 are some constants of integration. Okay, we can easily check that t prime prime equal f of x. So that general solution indeed satisfies the differential equation. The two parameters c1 and c2 are completely arbitrary at this point, but we can fix them if we incorporate the boundary conditions. Namely, we will know that t minus L over 2 equals some temperature t1 that is constant. And let's say t at L over 2 equals some other temperature t2 that is constant. Now, with those two equalities, I can set up a linear system of equations which, set is, which describes the parameters c1 and c2. I mean, we can easily check that c1 and c2 satisfy two equalities, namely c1 times minus L over 2 plus c2 equals t1 minus s of minus L over 2 and c1 times L over 2 plus c2 equals t2 minus s at L over 2. Those are linear equations 
in the parameter C1 and C2, and we can set up a linear system of equations. The matrix in that linear system of equations has a rows minus L over 2, 1, and L over 2, 1. You can easily check that for any positive L, that matrix is invertible. And so an explicit formula for C1 and C2 is given by the inverse of the matrix with entries minus L over 2, 1, L over 2, 1, multiplied with the vector T1 minus asset minus L over 2, and T2 minus asset L over 2. In that way, we can explicitly solve the boundary value problem. And then T will be the stationary heat distribution when the heat generation term is given by the function f, and we have constant temperatures maintained at the left and the right end point of the pipe. I'd like to give you a general outlook on boundary value problems in mathematics and also to the extent that we are going to treat them in this class on numerical analysis. Basically, I just want to ramble a bit about the larger picture of mathematics and numerical analysis. The examples that we have seen in this video and which we're going to see in further videos are mostly one-dimensional boundary value problems. For example, we have got the vertical displacement of a bridge, which can be modeled one-dimensionally. We have got the vertical displacement of a beam, which can be modeled one-dimensionally. And we also have discussed the stationary heat distribution in a one-dimensional pipe. That being said, virtually all interesting boundary value problems that arise in physics and engineering can in principle be modeled in arbitrary dimensions. The number of dimensions basically depends on the model that you employ in physics or in biology or engineering. For some models, one dimension might be sufficient. For other models, two dimensions. Of course, the most important number of dimensions is equal to three because we live in a three-dimensional world and so most interesting differential equations that arise in practice are posed over a three-dimensional space. For example, we can discuss static heat distributions in one dimension, in two dimension, in three dimensions, and basically also in higher dimensions, like four, five, six, and so on. In that context, these boundary value problems will be stated in terms of partial differential equations. A partial differential equation is an equation that involves the partial derivatives in different directions of an unknown functions in different variables. Now, partial differential equations are not going to be part of this class. We will see a few examples of those for motivational purposes in order to improve our understanding of what is actually happening. But the major focus of computations and also numerical methods will be about partial differential equations in only one dimension. In particular, the boundary value problems that we're going to treat are, in some sense, one-dimensional partial differential equations, where we only have functions in one variable. So it's fair to say that these are just ordinary differential equations. An ordinary differential equation is a differential equation where the function, where the unknown function depends on only one variable. And that's the only difference between ordinary differential equations and partial differential equations. So in some sense, the boundary value problems that we're going to talk about are one-dimensional versions of much more famous partial differential equations. And by and large, the research areas of ordinary differential equations and partial differential equations are quite different. The mathematics of ordinary differential equations and partial differential equations are very different. And for practical purposes, the differential equation that appears in an initial value problem with initial values assigned will have vastly different theory than the same differential equations in, in a boundary value problem, the boundary values are assigned. So while ostensibly, both with initial value problems and with boundary value problems, we are still talking about differential equations the mathematical look and feel, so to speak, and also the numerical methods that we're going to use are going to be two worlds that are completely different.
That all being said, there are also some connections between initial value problems and boundary value problems. So on the one hand, typically boundary value problems describe conditions that are in some sense the limit of initial value problems. For example, if we watch the, the evolution of the heat distribution in some configuration, for example, we may be, somewhere we have got a heat source, some we have maintained the temperature constant, as in our example with the heated pipe, then at first we are going to see heat dynamics. We're going to see dynamics where things change, but eventually in many examples in physics, we are going to reach a static configuration. And quite typically, boundary value problems describe static stationary configurations that, uh, that emerge after, that emerge over time as we watch some evolution problem unfold. Also last but not least, there are combined initial value and boundary value problems. For example, if we have got, for example, if we take a look at a heat distribution, maybe within the pipe, for example, if you take a look at some heat distribution, that we let it evolve over time within some physical encasement, then on the one hand, it's an evolution problem. We have some initial value, some initial heat distribution, and we watch it how it and we watch how it evolves over time. But we can also impose boundary conditions that are valid all over time. For the numerical analysis of such configurations, we need to combine techniques from the discretization of ordinary differential equations for time-dependent problems and also numerical techniques for stationary problems. Now the discussion has mostly used techniques from the theory of real analysis and ordinary differential equations. And while that is sound from a theoretical perspective, there are some issues if you actually want to solve differential equations that, that arise in physics, engineering, or in biology. For example, in many cases, we simply can't find the double antiderivative of f because f is perhaps some function that is too complicated to take the antiderivative. And even then, maybe the function itself is only known up to some error. So while those techniques from pure analysis are helpful to give us some theoretical understanding, and also to study some model cases, we actually need to change our approach and our perspective quite a bit if we want to get hold of some practical problems. And that leads us to what this class is about. Namely, we're going to discuss the numerical analysis of boundary value problems.